up, everybody? Long time no see. Haven't done a long, haven't done a live stream in quite some time. As you guys may have noticed, you know, a little busier doing some content, you know, here and there, shorter videos. Kind of, you know, kind of going the route. Maybe a little less editing, more just authentic, you know. Trying that out, trying a little less, you know, just kind of showing showing people kind of what I do, you know, what I do on a, you know, outside of, you know, these edited topics of, of exercise, just kind of, you know, giving you guys a more, a more personal peek into, into the things that I do, you know, when it comes to the, the diet, the nutrition, you know, preparing for sports, stuff like that. So I hope you guys liked it. Um, if you do like it, great. I'll continue to do it. If you don't like it, do something else. You know, it's life. I'm trying things. So, today, just wanted to do a QA. and a No, I haven't done these in a while. If you guys want to ask me questions, post them in the comments, and I will answer them to the best of my abilities. You know, <clears throat> in terms of the questions, um, you know, if you could just, you know, try to stay away from, you know, frequency and volume questions, okay? Um, because if you don't know the answer to that, you really only got to watch like a couple of videos on my channel or just download the Golden Air system and you'll get the answer to that like this. It's a very simple answer. Quite frankly, it just, it's kind of a waste of time answering it because it's, it's there. And, you know, volume and frequency is going to vary between individuals. There's your answer. So, you know, and if you, you know, also could just kind of avoid questions like, you know, if I do, you know, these exercises, is that good? Here's the thing about exercises. If you guys have been following me for any, any amount of time, you know, the view on exercise selections, it's simple. All right. Does the exercise address the primary function? of the targeted muscle group or targeted muscle area? If the answer is yes, well, you're on the right track. So we need that step. Step two, is the exercise safe? If you can answer yes to that question, well, you're 75% of the way there, 66.6% .6 of the way there. Number three, is the exercise efficient? Okay, these are the three things you gotta look for. If you can, get those three things in an exercise and guess what they're all equal in terms of what they're going to do to your body because remember as long as you're addressing the targeted muscle group motor unit recruitment is based off of effort you're not going to get and, and despite these um studies with these uh what did they use um I'm drawing a blank on the measurement tool they use to, to, you know, for muscle activation. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> the highest muscle activation is going to be when you push your body the hardest. We've known this since the fucking early 1900s. Okay. So when you hear these exercises, well, like, well, all oh, this trains the glutes better than this, blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah. If you're not training very hard, some exercises may be more difficult, which is going to, guess what? Increase motor unit recruitment. But as long as motor unit recruitment and intensity, you know, it's you know, it's kind of all the same. You're training hard; they're all going to be equal. Okay. So, when it comes to exercise selection, it's a lot of preference. It's a lot of the the tools you have available. Like, um, you know, my golden era system. It gives you very, you know, I had somebody ask me today, you know, why aren't Romanian deadlifts included in the golden era system? Well, remember, the golden era system is not a all-encompassing detailed explanation of high intensity training that's what my coaching is for that's what live streams are for the golden era system is an introduction to it introduction to the principles just because i don't have a particular exercise in the golden era system does not mean that exercise can be completely thrown away there's tons of exercises um you know in my golden era system i don't even believe there's a push-up in there you know push-up's a great exercise so you know, just because you haven't seen me do an exercise or just because it's not in the golden era system does not mean the exercise is useless. It doesn't mean necessarily sucks. 
So when you're asking me about exercises, just keep that in mind. I mean, guys, you know, if you're if you're training with adequate intensity, it's all they're all pretty much equal. Um, personally, I swap out exercises just because, just because I get bored of some of them. So you know, you can swap out exercises based on boredom, whatever. So we got the first question here. I'm just gonna go through. Um, the first question, super chat. Hey, by the way, I mean, if you give, if you do a super chat, I'll answer your question first. Obviously, I'm going to uh, repay <coughs> your contribution with a quick response. So the first one by dumb username, which is actually a brilliant username in my opinion. <laughs> How you got that is beyond me. I'm surprised it wasn't taken. Okay. Ironically, I herniated a disc by trying to strengthen my back to avoid back pain. Uh oh, I'm sure it was because of poor lower back machines. Mm. I got an epidural, and when I recover, how do I train my back safely? So I don't think it was the machine. I think it was your execution of the exercise. High force is what produces injury. It doesn't matter what you use. If you're producing excessive force, there's a, there's a potential for injury there. Likely what happened is you probably performed the exercise a little too quickly or with too much weight. All right. A MedEx lower back machine could be dangerous if you do it incorrectly. You know? So when you're when you're doing a back machine, when you go into the position of torso flexion, take your time coming out of that position. Go really, really, really slow. Okay, if you come down and shoot back up, well think about it. How do most people how do most people hurt their lower backs? They bend over and they shoot back up. Okay. Uh, this is because you know the the low back Lumbar muscles are in a stretched position and they're weak. So your body tries to use momentum to overcome that insufficiency. So coming down in torso flexion with a lower back machine or say you're doing it like this. Come back nice and slow. Take your time at the bottom. There's no rush, guys. There's no rush in these exercises. Remember, what is the objective of the exercise. It is to stimulate the targeted muscle group to produce, if we want to get technical, the purpose of the exercise is to stimulate an adaptive response in muscle. And with that, all of, and this, uh, Drew Bay says it like this, follow Drew Bay's channel, Drew Bay High Intensity Training, fucking awesome channel, really good friend of mine. The way he likes, this is the way he says it. I literally reiterate it word for word based on what I heard him say. The purpose of the exercise is to stimulate an adaptive response and with it all, an adaptive response in all the other general factors of functional ability which support the muscle. Bone, connective tissue, uh, metabolic uh, efficiency, cardiovascular efficiency, whatever. So that's the goal, okay? The goal, remember, is not to lift the weight. I remember Kai Green said this in a video that's like, geez, 10 years old. He said, I'm not a weightlifter. I'll never be a weightlifter. And when I heard that, I was like, damn, that makes sense. Kai Green is not a weightlifter. He's a bodybuilder. He said, my goal is not to lift weights. He said, my goal is to stimulate he used to say hypertrophy, that's the way he pronounced it. Stimulate hypertrophy by progressively overloading my muscles against more and more resistance over time. You know, that's that's what he said. Mostly correct. And he was right. That's the goal. The goal is to stimulate an adaptive response. Muscle growth. Muscle strength. And all the general um, factors that come along with that. Now with that in mind, what, what creates the stimulus... Some people want to say mechanical tension. Yes, of course. Duh. You're lifting weight. There's going to be some mechanical tension. But what's creating the stimulus is, is the motor unit recruitment. 
how do we create motor or how do we recruit motor units by contracting our, our muscles against resistance okay do we need to move <laughs> for our muscles to work against resistance well uh, i got a dumbbell right here and let's 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 see Would we agree that my biceps muscle is working against resistance? Yes or no? Like Tony Robbins says, yes or no? Well, yes. Am I moving? No. My point of saying all this is it's a good idea to take your time because the movement is not required for motor unit recruitment. So likely when you're doing the lumbar extension, you were shooting up in a position of torso flexion. Potentially what caused that. So what do you do to recover a trainer back safely? First of all, wait till the pain is mostly gone away. Okay, if you if you ever hurt if you herniated a disc, um, well, I mean you're obviously gonna want to continue to train your lower back. But just do it really, really slowly, safely. You know, we don't need to be like, we don't need to train our lower back or, or our multifidi musculature like we're doing a bench press or a squat. We don't need to go like crazy balls to the wall intensity. Um, you know, get to failure, close to failure and move on. Maybe you're doing too much weight. Maybe you're literally pushing too hard. You know, a lot, a lot of different things. But what I would suggest I mean, you gotta you gotta keep training your back <laughs> because if you have a herniated disc, having a strong, you know, multifidi is gonna really help you when it comes to functional mobility in day to day life. So, I hope that helped. That's what I would recommend. Um, you know, you can reach out to me for coaching if you want me to walk you through this whole process and do it safely, do it correctly. Um, you know, just click a link in the description. Actually, let me just put that link there now. Just didn't do it. Oh, yeah, it is there. Okay, yeah, there's a link in the description. You can click that if you want me to help you through it. And also, guys, if you want to just like do a like a call with me, like a one hour call, you know, shoot me an email, jvinsetfitness at gmail.com. Um, shoot me a DM on Instagram, underscore j underscore Vincent. We do something like that if you guys need a little, a little extra attention, a little extra help. Oh, uh, hold on. Where's that chat? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it took fucking fifteen minutes to get by one question. <laughs> All right, let's see. Lemon rations. Where do you guys come up with these names? Anyway, <laughs> like, what does that even mean? Funny. Um, I'm not dissing you. It's just it's just such a random, arbitrary combination of words. All right, I've been recently getting headaches during my workouts. What's the fix for this? How do I avoid this in the future? That is called an EID or EIH, exercise induced headache. Now the cause of this is <clears throat> poor venous return. So we have blood in our blood brain barrier in our skull and if you are relatively deconditioned, untrained, maybe kind of weak. Our body's ability to push blood back up to our brain during a workout through venous return is not very good. Therefore, we have a reduction in the amount of blood up here because our body's not pushing it back up very well. And this is what causes the exercise-induced headache. So if you're having an exercise-induced headache, um, I would say stop when you have them. Focus on your breathing. Keep your jaw relaxed, face relaxed. <sighs> Breathe calmly and openly. Um, Adam Zickerman, Power of 10 in Form Fitness, he found that training the shoulders and their, the upper body first kind of helps reduce the exercise-induced headache. But as you get stronger over time, your muscles get stronger. 
your, your, your venous return will improve. Your body will be able to push that blood back up more effectively, and the exercise-induced headaches will go away. Okay, I've had tons of clients. Okay, I haven't had tons of clients with exercise-induced headaches, but I've had more than 10, um, and that's just what we know. They, they were always you know, an individual who never, who hasn't worked out in 40 years, like a long time. And then they come in, you know, I remember, what was her name? Um, oh, short, short little chubby lady. Um, very nice lady. But she was, she got them for the first few weeks and then she got stronger, gone. So keep that in mind. All right. Alphonse, is it still okay? She was a bar machine. With a slightly pronated grip for biceps, even if you have a narrow carrying angle. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, your biceps are still going to be, you know, if you take a dumbbell and you pronate, your biceps are still contracting. Not as much. You're going to feel them much harder when you supinate or even in a neutral grip. But if I pronate, look, there's still tension there. Not ideal for training the biceps, but you know, there still is there still is tension there. It's, your your brachialis and brachioradialis will be working, you know, will be, you know, pulling most of the weight, but that's fine. All right, RVB, you've talked about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy already, but do you think there's no variable benefits at all, like creating more space for myofibrils to grow or better nutrient delivery? There is no evidence anywhere that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a cr alone is a chronic adaptation of muscle growth. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a temporary acute change in the amount of sarcoplasm in the muscle cell accompanied by an increase in myofibrils. You cannot only chronically for the long term, only increase sarcoplasm. Doesn't happen. Okay, it's a it's a really silly belief. But you know, they, they, you know, their studies will show that some people may increase sarcoplasm more than others. Um, but it's not a chronic adaptation. You cannot only increase sarcoplasm chronically. Okay. You know, the, the argument that, you know, more sarcoplasm may, you know, allow you to hold more glycogen. That's true. Not chronically. Okay. The adaptation, the physical adaptation is not for holding more glycogen. It is more contractile force, which is the addition, the, the increase in the myofibrillar pool. Okay. So you can't, um, you cannot only increase sarcoplasm as a permanent adaptation. All right. All right, Chris Hillas, Hillas, Hillas. <laughs> Could you give us an example of how you train a muscle that is typically trained at different angles by most gym goers? For chest, for example, would you do one set of incline, decline? No. No, there, your, your body's ranges of motion are capable of an infinite number of angles. Infinite. Like when I do a chest press. There's an infinite number of angles. There isn't three. There's a decline, horizontal, and incline. There's an infinite. So how do you pick it? The truth is, with a slightly inclined chest press, you are going to recruit more of the clavicular head. With a decline, you're going to recruit more of, I believe it's called the abdominal head. A little bit. But... Unless you are a professional bodybuilder who's going to be 4% body fat on stage and you make a living off of the symmetry and development of your muscles, you would never notice a difference. So a lot of you guys are, are thinking about, well, I got to train decline, I got to train incline, I got to train the inner chest, the outer chest. First of all, you cannot train the inner and outer chest. Ridiculous. Second of all, worrying about training the muscle at all these angles, you wouldn't you, you will never have the muscular development or the leanness to even see the difference. So why would you waste your time? 
there may be value in this for bodybuilders. But for most of my followers who are, um, you know, just gym goers, just average people, why would you worry about training the muscle at all these different angles when you're 15% body fat, 20% body fat? You know, when you're not 240 pounds of muscle, you, you wouldn't see the difference anyway. E even if, even if there was, and there might be a slight difference in the development, you wouldn't notice. And I doubt there are any professional bodybuilders watching this shit. May make a difference for them. But for you guys, you are wasting your time thinking about training the muscle with these different angles. and You're never going to notice. You know, you're normal people. You're not professional bodybuilders. And, and most of the shape and development of your muscles is determined by genetics. Muscle origin and insertion. Muscle belly length. Versus tendon length. Bone structure. <clears throat> All right. Jason Frisk. When focusing on fat loss and calorie deficit, is it normal to not be progressing in strength, hitting more reps, weight at the same rep cadence before reaching? Um, yeah, it is normal. You may see a reduction in strength when you are reducing your calories. Yes definitely normal. But remember, you will not have an infinite increase in your muscular strength over time. You will see kind of relatively rapid improvements in muscle strength when you first start, but it's going to slow down. So when you get to the point where you're not seeing increases in, in reps and weight or time under load, remember that's going to happen eventually. You're going to hit your genetic limit. So don't worry about it. Okay, Joy Pass. Could you explain motor unit recruitment in relation to the force velocity curve? Please explain how Paul Carter is right or wrong. Um, I'm not sure what Paul Carter says, but reductions in velocity are required for increased motor unit recruitment. Um, so, and that is the reason why heavy things are lifted slow. You know, if you go to lift something really heavy, like I, I um, last week I bench pressed, I think, 335 pounds. Um, and the rep was, it looked like this. Why? Force velocity curve. Why is it then, why is it that your one rep max is slow? Force velocity curve. Because it takes time for your body to recruit motor units, create cross bridging in order to produce the necessary force to overcome that resistance. So you need to train to the point <laughs> where, you know, and, and here's the thing, when you get to the point where you're very close to failure, your velocity will unavoidably slow down because your muscles are weaker. Your, your uh, slow twitch intermediate motor units are fatigued and your body is recruiting those fast twitch high order motor units to produce enough force to overcome that resistance and that is why the velocity slows down now if you're recruiting can you recruit fast twitch motor units using quickly yes initially though so if i were to lift something really fast i'm going to recruit fast twitch motor units to overcome inertia momentum is going to carry it the rest of the way so there is some truth that explosive movements train fast twitch muscle yes but the fast twitch muscle the fast twitch motor units are recruited to overcome inertia they're deloaded instantly when momentum takes over and you're producing excessive force okay so what is responsible for motor unit recruitment effort every time you get confused about motor unit recruitment just come back to effort Effort, effort, intensity, effort. Henneman's size principle has not changed. It's never going to. So I don't know if... Uh, yeah, so uh, Paul Carter believes that you need to try to explode on the concentric phase of the range of motion to optimize motor unit recruitment. But it's wrong. 
because it w- will ex- trying to explode with a very heavy weight increase your effort tremendously? Yes. Well, pushing against a weight as hard as you fucking can. So say, for instance, I explode with a heavy weight like Paul does. <sighs> Is that going to have huge motor unit recruitment? Fuck yeah, it is. But here's the problem. I come down and I change direction quickly. Now we're increasing force, shearing force on our pec tendon. What happens eventually? Watch Sam Sulik. Watch Sam Sulik tear his pec. I give it within six months the way he bench presses it's coming it's coming that's what we're trying to avoid having good motor unit is not a motor unit recruitment is not enough you also need to protect your fucking joints what good is sam sulik going to be when he tears his pec what, what good bodybuilder are you if you tear your pec so even if exploding on the concentric resulted in a little better motor unit recruitment, which it doesn't. Because again, what if I was lifting and lowering slowly and I get to the point where I'm stuck in the middle? I can't move the weight. Go ahead. Try to explode. Try to explode. It ain't going nowhere. You, when you start to approach failure, try to explode. It's not going to move. Intensity is going to go through the roof. Motor unit recruitment, through the roof. Okay, It's not necessary to try to explode through the concentrics. It's just wrong and it's dangerous. Even if, which is not true, motor unit recruitment was slightly better on explosive concentrics, which it's not, it wouldn't be worth it at the risk of damage to your joints. Why would it be worth it? It wouldn't result in anything you would notice in the mirror. It wouldn't result in anything that you would even notice. What it would result in, however, because remember, okay, if if going explosive through the concentric is this much better and taking your time to, through the concentric and getting to the point where you're pushing as hard as you can, as hard as you can and the weight is not budging, gives you this much more to unit recruitment. How are you going to notice that in the mirror? Which is what most of you guys are concerned with. You're not going to notice that. But this one's going to almost certainly give you tendon problems. So that's why I disagree with Paul, Paul Carter on that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if he's had tendon problems. Um, but if he hasn't, there's a high likelihood... That he will. Do you believe that we need to consume 3,000 to 6,000 milligrams of potassium daily? Blood Eagle. I have no idea. I'm not a supplement micronutrient expert. I can give you, you know, basic answers about diet for fat loss and muscle growth, but I'm not fucking Dr. Berg over here. All right. I don't know shit about potassium. Potassium. <clears throat> All right. So. Super chat. I thought there was another one I missed. Sorry about that. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Rockhead. Uh, all right, Am One, been watching your content on Hit and incorporating in my training. Great stuff. Thank you. Oh, Danny has money. I've gained 17 kilos, around 40 pounds doing Hit, but I have not gained much strength. What am I doing wrong? Strength. Uh, you have gained strength. You may just not have as good or, or efficient of a neurological system as some people. So if you take 100 people and you have them do the same training program, some people will get freakishly strong but not gain that much muscle. Some people gain a ton of muscle but not really look as strong as the people on the other side. Most people fall in the middle. You've got to remember this is a bell curve. Some people will... Gain a ton of muscle, but not really display that much strength. Comes down to a bunch of different things. Could be neurological efficiency, your nervous system, or as Mike Bradley likes to say, how you're wired up. 
could be to leverage. You know, say for if you've got really long arms or really long legs, chances of you being able to move a lot of weight on a bench press or a squat, pretty low. You're not going to exhibit or demonstrate that much strength in the gym. So there's a variety of factors on, on how, how well you can demonstrate strength in the gym. And it may be not proportional to what you're used to seeing, but who gives a shit? That's what I say. All right, man. All right, I'm going to kind of scroll to the middle because there are so many questions that I'm, I'm going to just kind of randomly do it. <clears throat> Joe Rockhead, parallel bar dip range of motion. Does deeper you go in the stretch position have any additional benefits if such are taken to failure, whether full range of motion is shorter or longer? No. No. Because remember, movement is not required for motor unit recruitment. I'm recruiting motor units in my shoulder. Look, I'm shaking. Am I moving? No. So range of motion really doesn't matter. Uh, would you use high intensity training in conjunction with power lifting? Potentially on the off season as a safe way to improve just muscular strength. But with power lifting, the movements associated with power lifting are very skill-based and you need to practice them and you need to practice them very heavy. So power lifting is a sport. So it, it, it potentially maybe like, I don't know, you just got to practice. You got to practice power lifting and, and you got to practice those movements with heavy weight because your nervous system literally adapts specifically um, you'll, if you practice with heavier weight, you'll be able to move heavier weight. <laughs> you know, it's your nervous system is very specific like that. So, you know, how would you use it in conjunction uh, with powerlifting? I'd probably uh, use high intensity training kind of like away from a competition. Um, and then the closer I got to the competition, I would just kind of focus on the skill of powerlifting, just lifting heavy weight in the form that you have to do in the competition, getting the, the skill down the best. Okay, let's see, Misho. Based on your experience with a lot of clients, can you give me an estimation of how much more muscle I can build using HIT, training about 10 years, different styles? Well, I've had people in my coaching group, um, you know, I had a guy in his, I tell a story all the time, a guy in his 50s gained 10 pounds in about four weeks. I think most people have about five to 10 pounds of muscle left to unlock. And the truth is you won't be able to do it on your own because you're missing key components. And this is what I teach in my coaching. I teach you the things that you are missing to unlock your ultimate physique, like the, the your genetic potential. Most of the time, people think they're training intensely, but they're about 60, 70% of the way there. That's the biggest thing. Uh, people think they're training to failure, but they're not. So this is what I teach you in my coaching program. Um, everybody who joins it gets way better results. So if you're at kind of a plateau or you're determined to get that extra 5, 10 pounds of muscle, click the link in the description, join my coaching. I, you know, I'm doing a thing now where, you know, if you don't transform your, your body in like 90 days, I'll just give you all your money back. Works free. So if you guys want a sure shot way to know that you're unlocking your genetic potential, which a lot of people have a lot left, just join the coaching and I'll show you how. How do you feel about mechanics exercises? Should they be done in a high intensity approach? Or gait and proper movement mechanics and acquired skill. Um, what do you mean? Do you mean like sports specific skill exercises? I'm not sure what you mean by mechanics exercises. Okay, Joy Pass. Why is it that it takes six sets to double the stimulation from one set to failure? I heard that from Paul Carter a few times. Huh? According to what? Um... I don't know. I've never seen anything that suggested that in my life. All right. 
I haven't had any progress on chest press for months, but other parts have been improving. Why is that the case? Been training for 11 months. Well, you probably reach your genetic limit on the chest press if you've been training for 11 months. That's how it is, man. That's how it is. I mean, why do you care? You know, why do you care? You know, why do you care if your chest press is going up? Who gives a shit. I don't even know what my chest press is. Honestly, I'm at the point where I just, I'm just maintaining. So I just go in and stimulate my body. I don't even know what weight I use. Put on some weight, push hard, move on. Joe Cher. Recently switched from compound to isolation exercises. Is one more effective than the other from a, hypertroph for, from a hypertrophy standpoint? No. No, they are not. The purpose of isolation exercise, or they're actually the correct terminology are simple movements. The purpose of them is to reduce the involvement of other muscle groups so you can focus on training that one muscle group really hard. For instance, if I do a pull down, is it training my biceps? Yes. But also heavily involved are my rear deltoids, my forearms, my chest, my abdominals, my rhomboids, my trapezius, my latissimus. All these other muscle groups are involved. Now the reason I would do a biceps curl is so I can remove the involvement of those other muscle groups and only focus on all my attention and all of my effort on the biceps to get the most muscle fiber recruitment out of it by training it as hard as I can. That's the purpose of isolation movements. So they can be used, they should be, can be implemented into your training, but whether or not they're going to be effective is really dependent on, you know, on the individual. You know, if you're training really, really fucking hard, um, you know, I've noticed over the years, uh, I take biceps exercises out of my workouts most of the time. Because when I do a couple of like rows or pull downs, my biceps are fucking shot. So if you feel like you got more juice left in your biceps or other muscle groups, um, then yeah, adding a simple movement could be beneficial. What's the best bang for your buck for your glutes? Easy, squat or leg press. How long to rest before muscle atrophy begins? Well, there was a study in um, included in the paper by James Fisher, James Steele, and Dave Smith. The title is Evidence-Based Recommendations for Muscle Hypertrophy. There was a paper that showed even after three weeks of no training at all, muscles did not yet start to atrophy. But, of course, this is going to depend on the individual. Some people might atrophy muscles more quickly than others. But they show it even at about three weeks. Um, I believe it's probably more. For the actual contractile tissue to atrophy and go away, I bet it takes a couple of months. The sarcoplasm and the, um, the cell swelling and glycogen retention, all that stuff will start to go down within a couple of weeks. But the actual muscle, the actual contractile tissue, I think it'll take a long time. Uh, let's see. All right, Fojo, my dad started training hit. He's since been getting shoulder pains. Is there any danger in training with high intensity or is he probably just forming the exercises wrong? Yes, he's exercising incorrectly. <laughs> There's something he's doing wrong. Um, I've had, I remember this one guy I had, he was a pitcher in college and he was probably in his mid or late 50s when he came to me. He had a completely frozen shoulder. His shoulder was fucked up. And... Um, Trained him, high intensity training, never bothered him. In fact, his shoulder got better. Um, I had another client, you know, she was, I don't know, she's 60, early 60s, really small, really petite. What was her name? Some with a K. I can't remember my client's name. It's been so long. Um, and she had a bad rotator cuff. She was, she was very small and she was like, she was retired. And she said she used to work at the church and she used to like water the plants and mop, like volunteer. And the mopping and the watering the plants hurt her shoulder. That's how atrophied she was. Like she got to the point where she couldn't even really lift her shoulder. And um, I trained her on my shoulder press machines, lateral raises. She was fine. It got better. So something um, in your dad's uh, performance is bad. 
Oh, <laughs> I just did the max muscle mass calculator. Based on how thick your wrist, ankles, neck, etc., is it complete bullshit or is it an accurate way to estimate? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it could give you a general, this is from Santiago. I think it could give you a general idea, but I mean, look at Kai Green. You know, I was looking at this uh, with my uh, coaching group last week. Kai Green has skinny wrists, skinny ankles. Huge fucking muscles. Okay, Mike Mentor, big wrists, big ankles. Okay, but I think, you know, I think it could be an indicator, but it doesn't seem to be an accurate indicator at all. You know, I have, you know, average size wrists and ankles. You know. So, I don't know. I don't think that one. Okay. Dan Danit Luca, or Danut Luca. What happens in your body when the same exercises of high intensity become a little bit easier and don't feel sore anymore? Doesn't feel too fatigued either after. Well, soreness is... Soreness will take care of itself over time. You'll be sore... When you first start training, your soreness will go away. Your pain receptors will adapt, and you'll stop getting sore. Soreness has nothing to do with the effectiveness of an exercise. Your body doesn't adapt to exercises if you are continuing to use those exercises with a high level of intensity. Your body will learn the exercises. It will become more neurologically efficient at them. But if you're increasing weight as you get stronger, that neurological adaptation is not going to make a fucking difference. The only way an exercise gets easier is if you are not progressively overloading. Say, you know, I start doing barbell curls with 30 pounds and I stick with 30 pounds my entire life and I only do 10 reps. Well, yeah, your body's going to adapt and that's going to become useless. But as you get stronger, you increase the weight, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, in order to overcome that neurological adaptation. So your body doesn't like adapt to exercises as long as you're progressively overloading. All right, Joy Pass again. Good questions. Would you agree that muscle damage limits muscle growth and actually doesn't cause hypertrophy? Yes, that's a fact. I feel like the fatigue literature is more scientific compared to the current hypertrophy studies. Yeah, there is a um, a um, narrative review um, published in 2022 by Stu Phillips and some other people, and they found that Metabolic stress, mechanical damage, um, increases in endogenous hormones don't contribute to muscle growth. So I would agree with that, yes. Uh, muscle damage doesn't really seem to have anything to do with muscle growth based on the current literature we have. Remember, guys, this, a lot of this shit is subject to change. <laughs> you know, Who knows? You know, In 20 years, what we'll find out. But based on the current literature we have... Um, I mean, you know, I'm just I'm just saying what seems to be evident based on the current literature. That's what I'm saying. If it all fucking changes tomorrow, it all changes tomorrow. Whatever. I don't care. I'm not married to anything. I'm just. I'm just. Um, teaching what the evidence finds. Do you not find working out of normal gyms piss you off? I do find working out of normal gyms actually do piss me off. It's funny that you say that. <laughs> I was asking a guy if he was finished with a chest press. He said four sets and sat on his phone. It was my last exercise. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it depends on the type of gym you go to. I mean, if you're going to a Planet Fitness or a Crunch or EO, Serenities, they're essentially, you know, watering holes with exercise machines in them. You're going to see that kind of stuff because people, you know, a lot of people did not grow up in real gyms, so they don't understand the etiquette. You know, the gym I grew up in, um, you know, a lot of people are very intimidated to go into the weight room because it was a bunch of meatheads and you had to learn gym etiquette. There was never a weight left on a machine in that gym. But a lot of these people didn't go through that experience. Their first gym experience was Planet Fitness. They didn't learn gym etiquette. So what you're better off doing is finding more of a bodybuilder type gym and going there. Or even like a powerlifting gym, considering they have decent equipment. Um, 
because they're they're not going to be there's not going to be people like that there. So that's what I do. The gy- the gym I go to, um, the gym I t- go to is uh, there's not people like that. All right, let me see. I'm just going to pick some at random here. A couple minutes to go. We'll go for like five more minutes. <laughs> Dumb username. I've had a ton of gains from reducing my exercise to two exercises a week. Rare genetics. It's nice to finally have muscle. Uh, yeah, guys. I mean, sometimes, you know, everybody's tolerance and recovery ability is different. Some people literally, as crazy as it sounds, might see better gains from fucking two exercises a week. I know it sounds crazy, but... Listen, we're not all pro bodybuilders. Um, just because a pro bodybuilder sees gains doing something doesn't mean it's best for everybody. All right, watching from the UK, Jerry Pugue. What is the newest exercise concept that you've come across that you'd be interested in doing more investigation into? Um... Hmm. I don't know. One one thing I I would be interested in doing more investigation into, which I haven't done much. I've used it. I've taught it. I was just never very interested in it. But one one exercise concept that could use more investigation, and I think it is something that should be more popular, is time static contraction exercise. Time static contraction exercise is almost like a fucking miracle for people who have mobility issues and nobody really talks about it nobody really does it um maybe someday i'll investigate into it more at the the current you know at this current moment i'm not that interested in it but man i'll tell you time static contraction training it could could solve so many people's mobility problems and exercise problems if it were just more popular. You know, I had a, uh, one of my clients had MS. He was, for some time, confined to an electric wheelchair. Um, I did a lot of time static contraction training with him. Manual resistance. You know, I literally, I did, you know, we couldn't use his legs. What would I do? I would have him extend his leg and I would just push against his leg for 20, 30 seconds at a time. Have him push hard. It just did manual resistance with him. We got him to the point in about eight weeks where he was able to use his walker again. He ditched the electric wheelchair. But we didn't even use any equipment. I just pushed on his limbs and had him contract his muscles hard. I'm telling you, time static contraction for like people with MS, it's like a miracle. Does fatigue impair hypertrophy caused by interference effects? Yes, to a degree, definitely. You want to minimize fatigue and maximize motor unit recruitment. How do we do this? Choosing a good target rep range. But we need to do it at the same rate. Like, so ideally what would what would really minimize fatigue and maximize motor unit recruitment would be you know doing a really heavy weight for one rep. Like your one rep max. But what's the problem with that? Excessive force safety issues. So we can't do that. Now, what's the other end of that? Well, we do a really lightweight a million times and really avoid all the force. What's the problem with that? A lot of fatigue, impairing motor unit recruitment. So that's why we choose a target rep range anywhere between like, I don't know, 4 to 12 reps, 30 to 90 seconds. So we can end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, what is your opinion about eccentric overload? Uh, it doesn't appear to be any more effective than just doing a set to failure. Um, for some people, it might help them recruit more motor units. Uh, but you're better off just really kind of learning how to push your body really hard. All right, there's a pooper chat down here. If you start TRT, do you have to be on it for life? Generally, it seems you do. Well, the thing is, Your natural testosterone production can come back, um, but it doesn't always, according to, you know, a friend of mine who prescribes TRT. It doesn't always. But, you know, a lot of people are on other medications for life, so I don't see the big deal. Gives a shit. 
Hi, Jay. Big fan, by the way. Thank you. Since you have said surplus is not needed for gaining muscle, how below an isocaloric diet can we be? And is the same muscle gain in a surplus than with low-calorie diet training? First part of that question, how much of a de deficit can we be in? It depends on the individual. Your maximum calorie deficit or the maximum amount of fat tissue you can mobilize for energy per day depends on partially, mostly, how much fat you're carrying. The more fat you have, the more of that you can mobilize per day for energy. The leaner you have, the less. So the leaner you are, the smaller your deficit. The bigger you are, the bigger your deficit, to a degree. Um, so, you know, how below a calorie deficit can you be? It's going to depend. It really is. I would say first figure out, you know, your maintenance calories, deduct 500, see what your body weight does. If you feel good and your body weight is going down, slowly and surely, don't fuck with it. Just keep it. If you're not losing any weight, reduce calories more. That's really it. Don't overthink it. Part two, is the same muscle gain in surplus? Is there the same muscle gain in a surplus than with low calorie? No. Surplus definitely has an advantage to gaining muscle, but it is not required to gain muscle. Okay, you do not need a calorie surplus to gain muscle. Do you need a calorie surplus to gain the most muscle your body is capable of? Probably. But that does not mean you need a surplus to gain muscle. You probably do need a surplus to gain the most muscle your body can. Okay? Does that make sense? So, uh, I mean, yes, you're going to gain less muscle in a deficit than you would in a surplus. But if you're 20% body fat, you have no choice. <laughs> Why the fuck would you go into surplus and have more body fat? It's crazy. What, just to cut it off later? It make any sense. All right, you should combine variable resistance, blood flow restriction, and lengthen partials for optimal gains. <laughs> Funny. Funny guy. Bill Murray, is it possible to gain muscle on maintenance calories even after years of training and sub 15% body fat? Yeah, definitely. Depends. It really depends on how hard you're training, um, how long you've been training hard, how close to your genetic limit you are. Tough to answer that um, confidently, but yeah. I mean, considering... You know, say you're doing traditional bullshit for the last 15 years that most people do in the gym and you're 15% body fat. Could you gain more muscle with a with a good training program, good intensity? Fuck yeah. But say you were doing, you know, say you were, you know, doing correct, intense training with optimal recovery, optimal volume of frequency over 15 years. No, you're probably there. You're probably... At your limit. Uh, Rob M. A couple more guys. If you want your question answered, we got about, what do we got? We got five minutes left. If you want your question answered, I got a couple more to go. Just drop me a super chat. I'll get to it first. Quick question. What are your thoughts on traditional free weight exercises versus machine work? Is there a significant difference in, say, a leg press versus a squat? No, there's no difference at all. The only difference is the tool, okay? Remember, the exercise, the tool, the machine, the free weight, whatever, is just a tool to provide resistance for your muscles to work against. Your muscles have no idea what is providing the resistance. It's just working against resistance. The downside to traditional free weights there's upsides. The upsides to traditional free weights is they're cheap, they're relatively efficient, and they have no friction at all. The downsides to free weights, some of them have poor resistance curves. Some free weight exercises require a lot of skill, which could interfere with you pushing your body very hard to stimulate the muscle group. Free weight exercises can be dangerous if you're not doing them correctly. All right, now over to machines. Advantages of machines, extremely efficient, extremely safe, almost no skill required for all of them. Great. Disadvantages to machines, sometimes awful resistance curves, sometimes awful friction, 
sometimes just straight up awful fucking design. So there are pros and cons of both free weights and machines. That's why I use a combination of both. All right, let's, ooh, Chris Bronson's here. So about the TRT, uh, Chris Bronson has a comment. Uh, follow his channel. He's on TikTok. I believe it's Dr. Chris Bronson or Dr. Bronson. Let me check really quick. He's got all the TRT answers. Uh, where is it? All right. C. Bronson NMD. Tick tock. C. Bronson ND. Follow him on TikTok for all your TRT answers. He says, yes, TRT can cause gynecomastia, but the way to manage that is to lower the dose or split it up into smaller dosages. Not use things like an astrozole. Yeah, a lot of people, their, their first step is like, kill your estrogen, but Chris Bronson disagrees. At C. Bronson, MD. Yeah, so if you guys got questions about TRT, uh, me and Chris did a live stream about a year ago. It was fucking awesome. Tons of info. Follow his uh, TikTok channel. He answers everything about TRT and testosterone that you could possibly imagine. You will literally find every answer <laughs> to TRT on Chris Bronson's TikTok channel. Um, I am like below a novice on TRT and hormones and all this shit. I can answer the best of my abilities, but <laughs> guys, I'm no fucking expert. Okay. Jabari, is there a reason you don't take tests in take rest in between sets? Many say it low it lowers motor unit recruitment. I do take rest in between sets. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I don't intentionally rest for several minutes in between sets or exercises. But I I go relatively quickly. I just don't wait around. You know, I catch my breath, I get ready, and I go again. But I'm not sitting there for three to five minutes. That's fucking stupid. Um, you also don't have to rush. The rest in between exercises thing is just something that's really, really, really irrelevant. If you are rushing, um, your, your benefit is not going to be any better. So in my studios, I would rush people, but not for the reason of, of uh, I would rush people because I don't know if any of you guys have ever been a, a trainer or a coach or something. Some people just don't push hard. Some people go in there and try to get away with not pushing hard. Okay. So what I would do is I would incorporate the rush factor and make them move from equipment to equipment relatively quickly to make the overall workout more intense. If they were just dogging it and they weren't pushing hard. Okay. But for individuals who were taking each set to hell and back, I'm not going to rush them. Does that make sense? So there's nuance. It's there's nuance to that to that question. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, guys, by the way, you know, if you hit a plateau, if you're not seeing the gains that you want, chances are you are doing something wrong. Okay, my golden era system will get your foot in the door. It's going to get show you the principles. But if you need to dial in those principles, you must join my coaching. You need to work with me directly. I need to show you what to do. Okay, so if you really do want to get the best gains possible, and that's important to you, click the link in the description, book a call with me. Learn about my coaching because I will get you there, okay? There's always something missing. And the way we do this is in my coaching group, I watch your training videos. I have you guys go film your workouts. We go over them in a small group setting on Zoom. I record them. We watch them together. Okay, here's Bob on the chest press. Okay, Bob, the way you change direction here, this is incorrect. What you want to do is blah, 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 blah. Okay, Bob, you're about four reps shy of failure. This is what you want to be thinking when you get here. And I want you to, to do this here. So for next workout, make these adjustments. Do this, do this, do this. And then you come back next week. We watch your training videos again. We make more adjustments. You go back, rinse, cycle, repeat. 
And then within like, you know, six, seven, eight weeks, you're doing everything perfectly. All right. Because we need to make these minor adjustments over time to get you to train with optimal intensity safely. And then we adjust volume, frequency. We do diet. So sometimes you guys might need this dialed in in order to optimize your response. I mean, you know, you... You know, we can all go stand in the mirror and cut our own hair, right? Uh, do you guys, I mean, some of you might, but do you guys cut your own hair? I know. I can do it. Why do I go to a barber? Why do I go to a professional <laughs> whose job it is to cut hair? Because you're going to get a better result. Why do you come to me and have me coach you? Because you're going to get a better result. Sometimes you guys going out there and training on your own. Yes, you're going to get your hair cut, but it's going to be a fucking hack job. You come to me, I'm the barber, I help you get the best result. That's the point. Sure, you can do it on your own, but go ahead. Go in the mirror and cut, cut your hair on your own. See how it comes out. You're not going to like it. All right, one more question. We're over an hour. Link is in the bio. Can you talk about metabolic adaptations? That is too generic. I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, Andre. Is progressive overload necessary to build muscle and strength? Or as long as you perform maximal effort, train to failure, you'll get bigger, even not necessarily significantly stronger. I think progressive overload is, to a degree, necessary. I mean, I can't take a 30-pound curl bar and do that for the rest of my life, even if it's to failure and likely maximize muscle growth. Okay, there's going to be a point in time where... If, if the amount of repetitions or time under load it takes you per set gets too high, so say it takes me 30 reps to reach failure, I don't think that's going to be optimal for muscle growth. It's not. So we need to increase the weight over time so we don't have to do a million reps to recruit all the available motor units. So yeah, progressive overload is necessary. Because you can't get to the point where you're doing 50 reps and expect optimal muscle growth with the same weight. No fucking way. <clears throat> All right, guys. Um, that's it for me today. Hit the like, the subscribe, the bell notification icon. Go ahead and get Golden Era System. By the way, guys, with Golden Era System, I'm updating all the videos. You know, I got the high-end 4K camera. I'm editing it. All the videos of Golden Era System are now, now going to be much longer with much more detail. Okay, before, you know, I filmed um, the exercises and voiced over the demonstrations. The videos I'm doing now, I'm sitting there in front of the camera explaining setup, explaining how to start the exercise, explaining how to end the exercise, exp explaining everything. And so now all the demonstration videos are about five, maybe six minutes long. In the past, they were about one minute. So I'm going through it. I'm replacing all these with much better videos in the Golden Era system. If you already have the Golden Era system, the videos will automatically be updated. You'll just notice that there are different videos there now. Okay. And if you haven't got the Golden Era system, super in-depth videos on all these things, high intensity training. It's going to show you how to get in the gym and apply high intensity training. That's what it's going to do. It is not going to answer every single minute question about high intensity training. However, that's fucking impossible to do. <laughs> so that is for coaching. That is for live streams. Okay. Uh, when will you see the update? You're not going to see the update. Just go through the videos and you'll see that different ones are there. Okay. I did chest press, leg press, abdominals. I did speed of movement, introduction, Intensity of effort. Okay, though I did, you know, what, six new videos. Okay, so they'll be there. You'll just see because they'll have a black background. They'll look different. Okay, so I'm not, you know, I'm not like, you know, you won't see like update. You'll just see longer, better, high quality videos, more explanation are going to be replaced over time as I film them, you know. Because, guys, it's tough. <laughs> you know, I can't go in the gym and film 40 videos without passing out. You know what I mean? So I'm going to do, you know, week by week, add three, four, five, or six videos. So over the course, over the next four to eight weeks, it's going to all be replaced, which is better, more in-depth, high-quality videos. All right? 
Whew. All right, guys, hit the like, subscribe, bell notification icon. Uh, go to goldenerrorsystem.com, pick up the Golden Era System. Click the link in the bio if you'd like to join coaching and get the absolute most out of your physique in a very short amount of time.